Philippines. Shalom. Next gen. Hi. Yeah, okay, you may be wondering why, why are we in this series? Why do we need a series on the book of Judges? Isn't the book of Judges filled with stories of uh, uh, violence, wickedness, evil, vengeance, uh, lawlessness, disorder, injustice? Can't we find something more encouraging and relevant to our times and needs to focus our preaching on? That's a good question. But let me tell you, the fact is, it is really relevant to our times. Because 3,000 years now, after those events that are recorded in Judges, um, humankind has not fared better. Christians still today tread the fine line between serving God wholeheartedly and dabbling with the gods of what? Gods of security, sex, self, and success, just to name a few. So the value of the book of Judges is in reinforcing the importance of what? Discipleship. The importance of disciple making. Because all the good of the past and current generations of Moses' and Joshua's will be wiped away. One, when God is not kept at the center. But other gods take first place. Two, when leaders do not govern responsibly and righteously, but everyone is a law unto oneself. Third, when discipleship is incidental and not intentional. Fourth, when God's people fail to advance His kingdom. So what's the net result? The net result is this. God's people will be dictated more by the surrounding culture than His word. And so you will have more Swifties than disciple makers. Whoa, and that can't be a good thing, right? I mean, okay, I'm not judging her, but well. See, the culture will identify with the culture quicker than with the Word of God. Because we see Israel struggling again and again through the cycles of what? They have peace, then they join the peace, but then they forget God, they will rebel. So peace, rebellion, and then because they rebel, God will allow them to be oppressed by the surrounding nations. And then prayerfully they repent. But you see, in many of the stories, they didn't repent. Him. They cry out to God, but they didn't repent. And then God in His mercy will deliver them. But as you hear from every judge, right, every subsequent cycle is worse than the one before. Yahweh, in His mercy, thank God for His mercy, He always intervened by raising judges. And if Israel responded pos positively to the judge, she would be saved. But as soon as the judge died, she would relapse you know, in her old ways. And to show that relationship with Yahweh was key to Israel's continual victory, and not because of the judges per se, God will raise up, raise these judges from the least, least likely places. Right? People, you would not have given a second thought, a second look, or a second consideration. God raised up ordinary people, like just like you and me. And so we've heard about uh, the two unlikely choices that Yahweh raised. One was the unlikely hero, and then the last week was the unlikely saviour. This is the third one. The third unlikely choice is Gideon, the unlikely warrior. Anyone named Gideon here? Any Gideons? No Gideons. Do you know any Gideon? Yeah? Okay, so no Gideons here. All right. Unlikely warrior. Say warrior. Warrior. Now Gideon is a, is a contradiction of sorts. He's the son of Joash from the clan of Abiezer of the tribe of Manasseh. Now his story is the longest in the whole Judges, traces the complexities of his character, where he moves from one extreme to the other. So is he or is he not to be emulated? That's, that's the question. He is what we will call today an anti-hero. He's a hero but also not a hero. His rise to fame and to faith is, uh, is deemed by his fall from glory. So Gideon's account serves as what? An encouragement of faith to us, but it also cautions us to put our faith in the right place. So when you see Gideon's whole story, you will see this arc you know, of him rising, rising in his faith, but also falling from glory. But nonetheless, from his story today, we can learn the big idea of this sermon is God wants all of us to grow in faith in what we do and in who we are. God wants us, all of us, to grow in our faith 
in what we do and in who we are. So the first lesson of faith we can learn from Gideon's story is, one, believe, believe who God says you are. Tell your neighbour, believe God. Believe God. Judges 6, 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Gideon, and said to Gideon, you know, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valour. Now Gideon appeared when, uh, in a time when Israel was going through another of their cycle. So we heard last week, 40 years of rest uh, under Deborah or Barak, right? And Barak. But then after the 40 years, she became again heavily oppressed for over seven years by the Midianites who worked with the Amalekites and the mysterious Easterners. So they all ganged up against Israel one more time. And in these seven years, they wrecked havoc because uh, they were well known for their camels. And the Bible described whenever the camels came, it's like locusts. So anything living any crops, any animals, any livestock will completely be wiped clean by them. So in a culture like theirs, in an agricultural society like theirs, right, this meant hardship. It means every time a crop will rise, it will be taken. Animals uh, breed and then the animals will also be taken. So they were, they were facing very, very hard times. In fact, Judges 6, 6a says, you know, and Israel was brought very low very low because of median. So that means Israel fell to a place, they were nothing like the glory that Yahweh intended. They were made to be very, very low. They had no freedom. They were constrained and they were constricted and they were confined. And so finally, because of all this hardship, verse 6, 6b says, um, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Isn't that, that what we normally do? When we go through tough times, right? There's no other solution. We cry out to the Lord. But you notice very carefully, the author of this portion, right, of Scripture, did not say that they repented. You know, just say that they cried out. And it's the same for us. Sometimes, you know, when we go through hardship, we're not repenting, but we just tell God, God, I can't take it anymore. So Yahweh, in His mercy, responded. But this time, He didn't respond by simply raising a deliverer, raising a judge. He did something else. He sent a prophet, an unnamed prophet, to rebuke Israel. To tell Israel, look, you are here not because I have abandoned you. Told them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear all these gods. You're not supposed to fear them. But the reason why you're in this hardship, you're in this predicament, you're in this trouble, is because you have not obeyed my voice. So Israel's problem was not military. It was spiritual. God was merciful yet to continue to deliver them, to rescue this loyal Israel. You see, the worst thing, when we go to troubles, the worst thing that God, uh, the worst thing that we can, we can experience is God abandoning us. Right? Turning a deaf ear, closing his eye, and then hardening his heart towards our cry. That's the worst thing that could happen. And yet, once again, uh, Israel came to God with crocodile tears. Uh. But despite that, the Lord was merciful. So Yahweh, because Yahweh had covenanted himself to Israel, and although Israel continued to fail, continued to disobey, he came, the Bible said, uh, he came as the angel of the Lord in person. Seven times in this chapter, the angel of the Lord came and called and commissioned Gideon uh, to deliver Israel. And so if you understand the setting, it's a remarkable thing that still the Lord listened to their cries and responded to them. So what was Gideon's reaction? What was Gideon doing actually? The Bible says that Gideon was busy hiding from the Midianites, right? Remember? So they have a fresh crop and they did not, he did not dare to, to, to winnow, right? This wheat, new wheat, out in the open air. But he did it in an enclosed area, in the wine press, right? because he was hiding from them. As soon as they see, they will come, they will confiscate, and they will lose that harvest. But then the angel of the Lord came, right? Interrupting what he was doing, and said, the Lord is with you. Oh, mighty man of valor. The word valor means bravery, courage, strength. You know? He said, Gideon, I know you're hiding there, but let me tell you, you are mighty. You're a mighty man of valor. So Gideon was like you, I mean, if you were in that situation, he was perplexed. Yeah. First thing, he was perplexed theologically. He said, if the Lord is with us, he asked this question, why? 
if the Lord is with us, you're telling me the Lord is with us. If He is with us, why has all this happened? That's the first question he asks. Then he says, where? Where are all those wonderful deeds we've heard from our ancestors, you know, from our fathers, from our forefathers? Where are these wonderful deeds that God did? Where is He now? Now see, theologically he had a problem because he blamed God for, for the situation. But God, the pro- in sending the prophet, told them, it's not really my fault. It's, it's you not, obe- not obeying me. You not, not having your believing loyalty in me. That's why it happened. So theologically, he was caught. So it's the same with us. Right? When, when things happen to us, God, where are you? Are you sure you're with me? Why is this happening? So blame God. Secondly, he had a problem. The second uh, reason why he was perplexed was the reason, uh, the problem of identity. He said, almighty man of valor. Then he answered, who? <laughs> me? you got to be kidding. Huh? How can I? Then he said, how can? How can I save Israel? So it sounds, sounds like he was Singaporean. How can? How can la? He said, my clan is the weakest. And I'm the least in my father's house. Listen, huh? he said, my clan is the weakest. You know, and I'm the least in my father's house. Later you realize whether actually was, was Gideon exhibiting false modesty here. Was he trying to say, you know, you know obviously not me. Or, or was, was it really true? That then Yahweh reassured Gideon. He said huh, in Judges 6.12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon, and said to him, the Lord is with you. Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And then he says again, I will be with you. So not only did, did God said you are a mighty man of valor, he said, go in the might that is in you and save Israel. I am with you and I will be with you. Okay, now, at this point, Gideon is confused you know, because he and his, and his tribe and his father's house, they have been worshipping Baal. Right? This angel of the Lord, who is this? So he was, he was confused. He said, are you really Yahweh? So he wanted to test. So in verse 17b, he says, show me a sign that it is you who speak to me. Okay? Then what did he do? He said, you wait here. Huh? He made the Lord wait. This angel of the Lord wait. I'm going to prepare a meal for you. I'm going to prepare a meal and then come back. And it was a big meal. It must have taken some time. Maybe he was hoping that by the time he comes back, there was no angel. Nah. So this is all his imagination, all his illusion. So he didn't have to do anything. But when he came back, the angel of the Lord was still there. And the angel said, I'm not going to eat it, but you place it there. And with a touch, you know, the thing was consumed with fire. So at first, Gideon was worried that this was not Yahweh. Now Gideon is worried because this was Yahweh. You know. Then he said, oh no, I'm going to die. You know. At last, oh Lord God, he says, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. And so Gideon here built his first altar to Yahweh and called call it Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. Because he saw the Lord and did not die, but was offered God's peace. So I don't know about you. Has anyone ever battled self-doubt and insecurity? Anyone? Yeah? Or have you been listening to people? People are telling you, you know, that you won't amount to anything. You can't do anything. You can't. You're not up for anything. See, often God raises up those whom others consider unremarkable, weak, unsuitable, and least likely to succeed. Perhaps the hero God is looking for is not the one sitting on your left nor your right. It's the one sitting between your left and your right. Who is that? Who is that? The biggest obstacle sometimes to us is not convincing others, it's convincing ourselves. Believe in who God says you are. See, in my very early days of ministry, one time at the retreat, I was still like, you know, thinking about a lot of things, go into ministry. Uh, then at one retreat, I heard, you know, I was, I was out of that hall and I was going to the gents. As I was going, so I was kind of like walking by myself, then I, I felt God telling me that He was the same God, his, He was the same God as Abraham, that same God, and He would be with me if I walked in faith, right? But it was hard for me to believe. You mean, God, you're going to bless me like you, you blessed Abraham? You, you would do that? Who am I, you know, that God would even notice? But when, when I heard that voice, and I, it took me some time to process and to believe in that, that was my turning point in ministry. Because anybody can tell you anything, right? 
we, we will face negativity. We will face people telling us, I don't think you're right for the job. I don't think you can make it. But when God speaks to you and you hold on to that, you know, that's going to be a turning point. Because our faith journey begins when we believe God knows us better than we know ourselves. You know, right? That's the first step to overcoming our fear, uncertainty, and self-doubt. God calls us based on the potential He knows that is in us. We just need to take Him at His word, no matter how strange, how ridiculous it may sound. Even when nobody believes in you, God does. Amen? So believe in who God says you are. Second thing, after believing who God says you are, you then need to do the, the second thing, which is obey what God say, calls you to do. Tell your neighbor, obey God. Okay, uh, believe, now obey God. Judges 6.25 That night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Verse 26, and build an altar to the Lord Yahweh, your God, on, on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bowl and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So the first test of Gideon's obedience involved usurping this idol of offense that was against Yahweh, this altar of Baal. This was the reason why Israel was suffering a predicament. This was the altar. Without the removal of this altar, no matter how many times uh, God will deliver Israel, Israel's victory will not persist because they were in spiritual adultery and God would not permit that. So Gideon's first task was, was to take down this altar. But it was further complicated by the fact that his father was the patron of this altar. It was the altar in his father's house. And so it takes a lot of faith to obey God. How many of you agree? It takes faith to obey God. Why? It is not natural. It is not a natural thing. Second, it goes against the accepted social and cultural norms. God is asking you to do something that is different from your, the crowd. It invites opposition. It requires a cost of oneself and sometimes of others. But it, takes, it needs a first step, no matter how scary it may seem. And so we can learn about Gideon, his journey of faith from mousy war, uh, warrior to mighty warrior. You know? He was a warrior, but we see how he became a warrior. Okay, also the context, you understand? Surrounded by Baal worshippers. Everybody was a Baal worshipper. It was going to be intimidating for Gideon to obey Yahweh, to pull down the altar. And furthermore, it was in, the, in his father's house. So under the cloak of night, he pulled down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole. Asherah was the goddess of, uh, of fertility. And true enough, when it was discovered, the idolaters struck back and they demanded blood. Who did this? They, they inquired and they found out it was Gideon. Now the first surprising thing was his father defended Gideon in the face of those death threats from the Baal worshippers. Now this fact alone, right, to, to have somebody like... Joash, the father, reason. You see, if Baal is really God, let Baal go and defend himself, right? Let Baal contend against Gideon himself. And so Gideon got a new name that day. It was Jeru Baal, which means let Baal contend with him. If Baal is really God, let us not get involved. Let Baal himself take care of this situation. So his act of defiance, right, pulling down this altar, made him Baal's number one arch enemy. And throughout the rest of his life, we find this. Uh, struggle going on. Okay, but we learn as the angel of the Lord came and commissioned, now the spirit of the Lord came to empower um, Gideon. And because of that empowerment, he sounded the battle cry and he rallied the troops of four tribes, Manasseh, uh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. So he was certainly, you know, he had new, new confidence. He said, oh, my, my father defended me, you know, so let's do it. So he called, he rallied the troops. And then I think he must have been disappointed because all the four tribes, right? He only got how many? He only got 32,000, you know. So he thought, wow, oh, I'm the big... Now he start to worry again. He start to go from warrior to warrior. So then he said, oh, no, no, no. This one, I, I, I need something more. I need a sign from God. So he asked, Yahweh, are you sure you're able to help us? You know, Baal, Baal is the rain God, the storm God. 
So he did the first test. He said, God, uh, I'm going to put this fleece, this skin outside, right? On the ground. Now, if you are really Yahweh, if you are greater than Baal, do this for me. Let everywhere be dry, but the flea, the skin be wet, you know. So one night, next morning he came. Wow, the skin, right? The fleece was so filled with dew that he, wow, you know, a lot of water came out, but the ground was dry. Now, so it was improbable, but not impossible because, you know, the skin the, will absorb all the, the, the liquid, the, the, the fluid. Not, not, not impossible, just improbable. But the next thing he said, oh, that's still not good enough. Can we do the opposite? Can we do another, another, another test where now, everywhere outside, the ground is wet, but the fleece is dry? So this is not just improbable, this is impossible. An impossible situation. Yet, next morning, it's come exactly. The ground wet, but the fleece dry. Wow, so he said, okay, this is really Yahweh, you know. Yahweh has fine control over the elements, not like Baal. He is stronger than Baal. He can even control to such a fine degree. Now he thought, okay, everything is okay. What happened? Now let's go and fight. But now it's God's turn to fleece Gideon. You know. He said, Gideon, how many people do you have? You have 32,000. How many people you know, uh, has the Median Knights and the Malachites have? 135,000. You know. 32,000 against 135,000. Can win or not? Can or not? What do you think? Huh? 32,000? 135,000? Can or not? Ideas? Any ideas? Okay, you never fought in a wall, so I can't maybe. Yeah. So, okay, so God said, first fleece. He said 32,000, right? Too many. Can you cut down or not? First cut. First cut, huh? 22,000 left. 10,000 remain. 10,000 remaining. So God said, still too many. Huh? 10,000 against 135,000? That's less than 10%. How am I going to fight them? Then God said, no, it's, it's, it's too, too many. The reason why God said this was, the Lord said to Gideon, Judges 7, 2. He said, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand. Lest Israel boast over me and say, and saying, my own hand has saved me. So first cut, 20, uh, 32,000 to 10,000. Second cut, reduced to 300 which is a 99% reduction. So what's the, what's the warfare like? It's one, is two, 450. One soldier to 450. You can't even start, you know? Right? If they use bullets, you'll be 450 bullets in you before you even take the first step. One against 450. So to expect victory, you're either mad or it's a, it's a miracle already. 300 against 135,000 is humanly improbable and impossible for victory. So that was how God fleeced Gideon. Now, do you believe in me? If you really believe in me, with 300, you can win. But obviously, Gideon is still shaking, right? He's like, 300, come on. 32,000, and I'm already quite scared. 300, how are you going to do it? So knowing Gideon was still fearful, despite the many signs, Yahweh was gracious to offer him one more sign. He said, go, go with your aid, Pura, and go and make an unannounced visit to the camp, to the Midianites' camp. And then when they were there, they heard a, a funny story, an exchange between two of the Midianite soldiers. And these two Midianite soldiers, they were recounting a, a dream that one of them had. In that dream, this, this man said, this soldier said to the other soldier, he said, in my dream, I saw this barley loaf of bread, barley, you know, loaf of bread, coming down upon the tent, in our tent. And when it hit us, everything collapsed. So what kind of story is this? Barley bread, loaf of bread coming down into your camp, you know? But then the other one must have been a prophet. You know what he said? He said, oh, Judges 7, 14. And his comrade answered, oh, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. What a strange story. Eh? So psychologically, they were already, they lost the game. Like. So he said, this barley bread must be Gideon, you know? And he's going to come and wipe us all. But they don't know that he only had 300 soldiers. 300, right? They were, they were severely outnumbered. And so in response to this unsolicited and overwhelming positive report, the Bible said that Gideon prostrated né, before Yahweh in worship. But this was his first and his last time. So the question I want to ask was, was having human affirmation more important than divine? Did he really believe who God said he was? Or he needed to hear somebody, a human being, say the same thing? Was he more impressed with what people rather than what Yahweh 
thought about him? Was he more concerned with how people rather than God saw him? But whatever his motivation, he returned energized and was ready to lead the attack. He said, let's go. Now, the method of, of warfare was irrelevant. If you read, right? In the left hand, they held a torch. In the right hand, what? Left hand, torch. In the right hand, trumpet. Where was the sword? No sword, right? They could not even put it in the mouth because they were supposed to shout. So no sword. Because no sword was needed. Judges 8.22, when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army literally routed themselves and then they fled. They thought, they thought that they had overwhelming, uh, the, Israelite, uh, the Israel was overwhelming. They thought, because they heard all this commotion and then they fled. So the question today is, are you a worrier or are you a warrior? Are you a worrier and you're worried about what other people say? Or are you, do you trust God to help you do what it is impossible for us to do? But if God said so, would you obey God? You see, Gideon started his journey of faith like many of us, not entirely sure that Yahweh was the God he should serve. When I gave my heart, I remember saying the sinner's prayer, right? I didn't know who God was actually. I just heard somebody say, oh, this is Jesus, believe in Him. I knew nothing. Now I know so much more, right? So that was, but that was an initial first, first step. For Gideon, he had to obey God by tearing down publicly the altar to this God of his past. This could be like us, uh, our public declaration of faith through water baptism, which is a defining moment for us to, to say that we have changed loyalties. We don't serve the God of the past, now we serve Jesus, we serve um, a new God, right? This God. So God was in, immensely patient with Gideon. No matter how many times Gideon asked for affirmation, confirmation, like us, the Lord is also immensely patient with us you know, when we seek to obey Him. See, the journey of faith for everyone begins with small baby steps of obedience. Baby steps. For us, it is taking the next step in discipleship by continuing, perhaps, to identify and dethrone the so-called gods of our culture. As soon as we, you know, go through life, we say, oh, this is a, a God that we shouldn't be serving. This is a God that we shouldn't compromise our loyalty to. And, and we know once we identify them, we dethrone them. We can start taking baby steps by joining a grace group or joining a ministry or by sharing the gospel of Christ with others. Those are baby steps. Or by going for a mission trip. It is with each successful step that boosts our confidence to obey God in what He has called us to do. So God is patient with you. He's not, he's not going to give you uh, straight away you know, the main big thing. He's going to ask you to do this first and then bit by bit, patiently, He invites us to join Him in disciple making. God knows exactly what each of us needs to be His warrior. See, our resources, our abilities may seem puny against the overwhelming odds like Gideon. See, but the victory is not dependent on our abilities. It is dependent on our willingness to trust in God and to obey Him. What God is looking for are human agents, human instruments, who are just willing to believe God for who He says we are and to obey what He has called us to do, to partner with Him. So don't be afraid to take small steps in the direction of obedience. As God was with Gideon, He is with you. Amen? Okay, finally, and this is the most important, I think. As you increase in faith and see God at work in your lives, you must not forget to remember God as the sole reason for your victory. Say, remember God. Remember God. Remember God. See, as the enemy would try to flee, right? So 300, and then the enemies fled. But they were running so much that the Gideon quickly called the Ephraimites who were nearby to come and help Sapu everything, you know. Ask them to go, hey, can you help us to pursue the Midianites? And so the Ephraimites joined them and they were successful in capturing, killing two princes of the Midians. But they weren't happy and they came back and they talked to, and they confronted Gideon. See, why you, come, why you only last minute asked us to come? You should have asked us earlier on, right? And look, notice what Gideon said, right? Gideon pacified them with this response in Judges 8 2. And he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is it not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Ebiezer? God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger against him subsided when he said this. 
So it sounded like, you know, he was doing, well, he was humble. But then you notice from this point onwards, had the Bible story of uh, Gideon ended with chapter 8, verse 3, then he will be forever known as the unlikely warrior, somebody to be emulated and celebrated. But the story doesn't end there, sadly. It continues. Now the story continues with him pursuing the remaining Midianites. And it's Gideon's fall from glory, from the famous hero to a forgotten zero. He became a zero. How did that happen? So right, now he goes after the kings. And then en route, he had to go to two places because the 300 men were still with him and they were exhausted. So he went to Sukkoth, the first place. He said, can you give us bread and water? He said, no, 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 we're not going to help you. Then he went, to, he went to the second stop, Penuel. Both these territories are in Gad, right? And both refused to help them. And so Gideon now, he's like a bigger guy, you know, like, hey, I, I am God's warrior. So he said, he took offense to, to, to them slighting him. And he said, when I come back, when I've done this, capture them, I come back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you guys. And he did that. He captured the, the, the two kings. And then he came back to Sukkoth. The Bible said, nah, he go and whip all those leaders, you know, those elders. But in Penuel, what he did was, he executed all of them. And notice, nah, something is strange. Because this, the people in Sukkoth and the people in Penuel are Israelites. They're not Midianites. They're his own people, you know? So he was so upset that they, they refused to help him that he came back with a vengeance. This was his personal vendetta. So something happened. Something happened to Gideon's heart. From that moment, it was more about Gideon and no longer about being the instrument of Yahweh to deliver Israel. See, as long as he realized and confessed that it was Yahweh who gave the enemies into his hands, he was safe. But as soon as he took matters into his own hand, it was the beginning of the end of him. But yet, despite all that, right, because of his military exploits, exploits, he was offered rulership over Israel, which he initially refused. Listen, Judges 8.22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Sounds perfect. That's a perfect textbook answer. But however, after this, he took offering from them. 20 kg worth of gold. And he fashioned an ephod. What's an ephod? Ephod originally was a garment of the high priest, which housed the urim and the turim for divination. And so somehow this became a snare. Listen, Judges 8, 27b. And all Israel hoard after this, after this ephod. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Gideon's account closes with an indictment, Judges 8.33. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel, what happened? Turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal bereth their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubal, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. What a sad, what a sad ending. You know, can you think of somebody that you know who started well but ended terribly? See, it's not just the high points in our life that we celebrate, but what happens after that? What happens after those high points? For Gideon, all that he has done, right? He was a timid, quit thresh, uh, thresher. And then he became a mighty warrior for the Lord. But then at the end, he left the nation further. He led the nation further astray. So his story actually marked the turning point for all the judges to come from this point. Every judge from then on will exhibit deep flaws that mar their leadership. So of course, this paved the way, not just for the kings, but for the ultimate king, who was perfect in every way, who was justice and righteousness in every way. That is the Lord, the Messiah. That, so every judge from then on had deep flaws. So what was Gideon's problem? What was his folly? What did he fail? He, he wasn't aware of the fact that pride always will come after success. There's always a tendency for pride to come after success. How sad, right? How sad that he forgot that God was the sole reason for his victories. 
He took credit for the good he did. It became more about him fulfilling his own desires and his own plans. Then the call of God went to the background. Instead of keeping his heart soft and pliable to God's commands, he carried out what he liked, what furthered his goals, what gave him the greatest personal gain or advantage. The need to exercise faith took a back seat. He became comfortable. He became safe in the environment he created for himself. He consolidated his powers and he lived like a king. So for Gideon, his faith, right? I said it's important for us to know where we place our faith. His faith was in Yahweh and then in the Elohim, then in himself and then in this idol of his making. It just kept shifting. So for us, the first sign of self-sufficiency is the neglect of God. Then the abandoning of God. So may the Lord not grant us success that we conveniently forget Him as our sole provider, as the sole reason for our well-being, for our flourishing, for our success. Because God wants those who stay loyal to Him, stay loyal to the end and not go back from their word. See, so Gideon's story is not just about a timid person becoming a warrior, a man of great faith. But also after that, it's a reminder of us that after success, you need to be careful. You need to remember that God is the sole reason for your victory. See, our Gideon's story is likened to our journey of faith. I remember years and years ago when I was being interviewed uh, to be on, on staff of a church. So the pastor who was interviewing me said, uh, Ming Cham, you know, music is not a ministry. Preaching, teaching, hospital visits, those are ministry. Wow, well, I was that was a blow to me because all I knew then was like music. <laughs> I thought music is like viable ministry. So when he said that, I felt smaller than I should. Well, wow, then what, what am I supposed to do? What am I good at? But then years later, right? Years later, pastors had this new idea, assumption eh, that one of the keys to church growth. Uh, was good music. Why? Because they assume good music means good worship. Eh? And when, when that perspective came, then, oh, I was welcome, you know. Some churches, big churches would call me, hey, why do you come over and help us, you know. So the net result was what? I felt bigger than I should. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm no longer in the thick of uh, the music ministry, but I've overheard some people who called me the label legend. You know? Legend, right? Now there are three possible meanings to the word legend. And I'm fine if the meaning is the third. Okay, let me give you. Huh? The first meaning of legend is a myth that is repeated for effect. Huh? Because the actual event, the actual person is much, much less inflated than the myth. Huh? That's the first kind of legend. The second kind of legend is someone who is admired for qualities that are deemed to be emulated. Huh? But the third meaning of a legend is that of the words written on or next to a picture, a map, or a coin. You know? that explain what it's about or what the symbols on it mean. Have you seen those legends? Right, you see a big map, you know, what does this mean? Then they go to the legend, oh, it's, it means this. You know, for the rest of my life, I would like to be that kind of a legend, you know, the third meaning. People ask, what is this? I point to Christ, you know, it's about Christ. I'm just, I'm just the little explanation there. How can you do this? It's, you know, it's Christ. Well, why, does it, how, how has this happened? It's Christ, you know. I would like to be the third kind of a legend. That means all of us are legends. Amen? All of us are legends. All of us can point to Christ. So the question is, is the God of Gideon your God today? Is He your God? Can you believe who God says you are? As Gideon did. Can you? No matter how strange, how ridiculous it may sound, you must believe because God knows you better than you know yourself. Secondly, are you able to obey God? Obey God for what He has called you to do. Obey Him. Your resources is not your reason for victory. It's your dependency. How you depend on God is how you'll get your victory. Amen? But the third thing is to remember. Remember all after all the success that God grants, and He will grant you success. He will help you flourish in all that you do, in school, at work, in relationships. He will because He's your God. But after the success, do you forget Him or not? Does it become more about you than about God? So the third thing you must is to remember that God 
is the sole reason for your victory. Amen? So turn from being a warrior to a warrior. But don't forget that the path uh, from hero to zero is shorter than you think. You know? <laughs> Amen? So let's just close our eyes. Let's come to the Lord today. And say, God, I am serving the God of Gideon. The same God who loved Israel, the same God who loves Israel, the same God who loves His people is the same God who is in my life, in our lives today. And so, Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters right now that they will hear clearly not the negativity of everyone else, not when people say, or even themselves, maybe they find it hard to convince themselves. But God, let them be open and say, Lord, I want to hear who you say I am. That is more important than anything else in this world. Who you say I am. And so with every eyes closed, every head bowed, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the God of Gideon, to respond to this same God. I don't know if you suffer from low self-esteem. Many of us do. I have. But you're not unworthy and you're not without purpose. Just the fact that you are created that means there is a purpose. You have immense value. God has made you for something. So listen to what God says you are and not to the voices of doubt or negativity. Those who want to bring you down, who want to make you small, who want to keep you defeated. And today, if you're among us, all eyes closed, heads bow, and you say, Pastor, I want my identity, who I am, to be rooted in Christ. Like Gideon, I need to hear God's true estimate of me. I want my identity to be in Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want you to quickly put up your right hand and then put, thank you, yes, yes, I see those, yes, I see your hands, thank you. Yeah, you can put that down. So here, believe who God says you are. Second group, you know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Maybe you're at a crossroad this evening and you're deciding, do I obey God or do I not. Obeying God takes faith. The people around you may not encourage you, but you know this is what God has called you to do and you want to make a decision that is right. You want to take the next step of faith to believe and then to obey God so that you can please Him in everything that you do. You say, Pastor, I really want to surrender to the Lord. I want to do what He wants me to do. I want to obey God in all that He's called me to do. I need help, I need courage, I need prayer. If that's you, quickly put up your right hand. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I see the hands on my left and right. Thank you for those hands. Finally, finally, some of us have been, you know, we thank God for moving in our lives, but some of us have been ensnared by our success. Somehow, enjoying the success that God has given us, we have put faith in the backseat. We have put God in the background. And we have, you know, we've become the, the warrior. We've become confident in our skills. We've become confident in who we are. And we say, God, you know, maybe I don't, I don't really need, need you. Maybe I don't really need God. But you're ensnared by your success. And today you said, you said Pastor, I realize what is happening. I realize what has happened. I realize this, the danger of pride in my success. And I want to turn over now. I want to turn everything to God and tell God I need Him in everything. That He's more important to me than the success I desire. If that's you, you want to remember not to forget God in your successes. You say, Pastor, pray for me as well. If that's you, I also want you to quickly put our right hand and put it down. Yes. 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 Can we all stand? Can we all stand to our feet? So if you are one of these, any of these, you for low self-esteem, you say, I want to hear what God wants, says who I am. Then you need to come. You need to come to the altar so that we can pray for you. And if you are at a crossroad, you're deciding, I need strength to do the right thing, to make the right decision, to obey God. You need to come forward. And if you are just, you know, you're just depending on yourself, God is no more the first love of your life. You're able to live your life by your own successes. You need to come out too so that we can pray with you. And so, as the worship team leads us in, in song, I'm inviting you to come out.
pastors, the leaders who will pray with you and for you. Let's do that. Let's just come before the Lord. Don't worry about too much about what people are looking at you who are, remember God is here. He loves us. He wants to set us free.